morning, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the lunch. Thank you, thank you for joining us today. My name is Slima Bay. <coughs> I am the program coordinator at the Anti-Racism and Cultural Diversity Office. We are super excited to have you join us today at the inaugural launch of our Race, Equity, and Action Speaker Series. Before we begin, <coughs> I wanted to remind everyone that today's event is being live streamed and recorded. As such, sorry, as such, people that require captioning on their electronic devices can visit the following link that will be on the screen in about two seconds, right there. <laughs> Thank you. To begin today, oh, and also if you need to use the microphone or during the Q&A session, please use the microphone. Um, to commence today's programming, I would like to introduce Michael White, who is the Special Projects Officer in the Office of Indigenous Initiatives. Please join me in welcoming Michael. Uh, bonjour. Is this on? Here we go. Ozari Makwas and about Anishnakas, Makwan and Dodem, Toronto in the Tonchi. Miguach Mishomas, Kibwa Seje and Nogum, Miguach to Kit Nogum Gishikak, Wavenichi, Quab Mog Nuiji Pamadas, Miguach Kimijang Nibish, Kimijang Wisin Yig, Kimijang Sewin. Sema, Bogdana Wabon Namadok, Jawan Namadok, Nakapihan Namadok, Kiwid Namadok, Jimishkoka Boyan Zong de Eon. All right, for those of you that don't speak in the Shnabe, I'll go through our land acknowledgement. This is uh, how we would acknowledge, uh, how we would begin in the Anishinaabe Moen. So for the English speakers, we wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it's been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Uh, today, this meeting uh, place is still the home of many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Uh, I was also asked about updates. All right, for sure. In the quick time that I have here, our office remains a resource to the university. Please continue to reach out to us for consultation advice on all things Indigenous. In terms of leadership transition, I'm excited that we have Kelly Crawford at the University of Toronto at Scarborough, and starting on Monday, T. Duke, uh, both assistant, dir assistant directors of Indigenous initiatives. And so really happy about that. Uh, internally, our calls for um, our annual report will be forthcoming. And uh, we're really happy about that. Anything you want to know about what we're doing, you can go to our website at indigenous.utoronto.ca. So thank you very much for that. Miigwech. Thank you, Michael. I would now like to introduce Kelly Hannah Moffitt. Kelly is the Vice President of Human Resources and Equity and full professor in Criminology and Sociolegal Studies. Please join me in welcoming Kelly Hannah Moffitt. And welcome everyone, and welcome in particular to our guest, Dr. Coleman. Um, it's my honor to be able to be here and open with my colleagues our first um, inaugural Race Equity Action Speaker Series, which is new, I wanna say Arcto, but it's not Arcto, because um, we all know the Arcto brand. But this is our new speaker series, and it is organized by the Anti-Racism and Cultural Diversity Office. These events for us are really important events for our community and we're hoping to continue them throughout the year and throughout next year. And the reason we're doing that is because we want to introduce you to some really fantastic people um, and speakers who have a lot of knowledge and experience in areas of equity work and a diversity of different kinds of equity work. And I think that Dr. Coleman will show and demonstrate that for us. But what it also does is it starts to create spaces in our community for dialogues and spaces for critical dialogues and for ideas and inspiration because there are many places where we do things really, really well, but we also have a lot of work to do. And even though we think we're great in many respects, we can certainly up our game in a lot of other respects. And so this becomes an opportunity where we can show our commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion. And we can also think about what are the, some of the new things that we can borrow, that we can make our own, and that we can expand on? 
So it's pivotal for us um, to make sure that we can actually live our values and we have values and we have commitments to equity, diversity, and inclusion. So how do we actually operationalize that and make that happen? And what are each of your roles in actually doing that? Because, you know, in the very short time I spent with Dr. Coleman, she's articulated to me some things about, like, we all have the capacity to do something to make a difference. So what initiatives are we going to take and what are we going to take away? And so we hope by doing these speaker series, we come together as a community, we learn, um, and we continue to expand on the work that we're doing both within our division centrally and institutionally, but all the fantastic work being done out in various other divisions and faculties across the university. And so with that, I would also like to thank Jody, Saima, and Nikki, who've done a fantastic job of putting this together and bringing um, Dr. Coleman to us. So thank you. Um, And I think that's all I'm going to say because we really do want to hear from Dr. Coleman. So I hope you find this event to be inspiring and educational for you today. Thanks. Thank you, Kelly, for those remarks. I would like to take a moment to share some housekeeping. The washrooms are located downstairs in the basement and the all gender washrooms are upstairs on the second floor. We are also asking that all technologies be placed on silent or vibrate. Thank you. At this time, I would like to welcome Numan Ashraf to, the, to introduce today's keynote speaker. Numan is the assistant professor at the Rotman School of Management. Numan also serves as the advisor to the dean as a director of equity, diversity, and inclusion. Please join me in welcoming Numan. Good afternoon. I joined Kelly in welcoming Dr. Coleman here. And Dr. Coleman, I did warn you and embarrass you a little bit about your accomplishments. Uh, before I do that, I just want to say a lot of people ask the question, why do we need appointments around equity, diversity, inclusion when we're so diverse already? And I actually think it goes back to the old saying, that which gets measured gets done. That's Albert Bandura, 1972. Ashraf 2019 adds to that. Not only is it true that that which gets measured gets done, that which gets measured gets gained. So I want to be provocative in my introduction uh, to Dr. Coleman and say that not only is it important for us to actually have appointees in these important roles, but to ask the question, how do we use these roles for getting at the, the big pernicious issues that affect us? For that discussion, I can't think of a better uh, colleague to start this dialogue. Dr. Coleman is at NYU, New York University. She's the inaugural senior vice president for global inclusion and strategic innovation and chief diversity officer. But she comes to this work very honestly. Prior to this, she has worked at Harvard University and currently her work spans all of NYU's campuses, including Shanghai, Abu Dhabi, and a, a range of other external sites. In her role, Reporting to the president, Dr. Coleman works with deans, internal stakeholders, external partners, and constituents to advance, promote, and build capacity for strategic global inclusion, diversity, equity, belonging, and innovation. Her scholarly work was sparked by early professional and research work with the Association of American Medical Colleges, Merrill Lynch, and working as an independent consultant with various for-profit organizations. She's had two decades of work working across the sector in education and has, in fact, done so across numerous universities, including at Tufts. Dr. Coleman continues to advise and consult with C-suite leaders globally. She sits on various national and international boards, and her current work focuses on the inter- and transdisciplinary intersection of innovation and inclusion within and across diverse cultures globally. Please join me in warmly welcome to the, to the University of Toronto, Dr. Coleman. Good afternoon now, it's 12.12, so we switched over from the morning. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for that warm introduction. Thank you for welcoming us to this land. Thank you uh, for organizing, Jody. Thank you for all that you've done. Um, really, thank you. And thank you um, for your commitment to equity, diversity, inclusion, and belonging work. And I'd also, I'd also like to thank all the people who um, help behind the scenes. There are all these people, I see them running around outside getting food and keeping the lights on and things like that. So we could, could we give them a round of applause? 
uh, sometimes they're unseen labor and work, but I do know that I used to be one of those people, so I try to remember, remember what it was like when. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit of today about some things. I'm going to go through my slides, some of them uh, relatively quickly. Uh, some of the slides are just to set the stage as opposed to really talk through them um, and really get to some of the bulk of what I think the conversation today um, to, and to talk about structure and how we, how we do this work. So the first... Um, so first, what I like to say is, when we're talking about diversity and inclusion, right, now, and certainly in the United States, there's a lot that's contained within that. So we're talking about race and ethnicity, we're talking about religion and national origin, and in the United States, we've had a lot of laws that have been passed um, in relation to this, and I'm going I'm to talk about that in a little bit. Um, but I would say right now, as we think about the, the trends and themes, that's where I really try to think about it. We are really focused on how do we take the historical meanings of what have happened in terms of the categories, and then what does that mean in the context? contemporary moment? How do we leverage this work and how do we make it useful? Where do we, how are we innovative and experimental? How do we sustain this work over time? So, and that's related to recruitment, retention, right? How is it generative, accessible, and leveraged? And how do we then think about what is compliant and regulative in that? And finally, obviously for me, I'm thinking a lot about the, the domestic and global competencies in this intersectional focus. So when we're thinking about diversity, inclusion, equity, uh, and the working definitions, one of the things I've said is that we've seen some shifts. So I'm just going to talk about the U.S. a little bit here. So in the 1950s through about the 1970s, what we saw was an emphasis on the law and compliance. By the time you get to the 1980s, 1990s, early, uh, early 2000s to some degree, I always say we in the United States decided to steal from Canada multiculturalism, and then we did it badly. And so... Um, um, and so it was without power, the analysis, there was a lot of food and fun, but not a lot of analysis of power in relation to culture. So by the time you got to the early 2000s in the United States, we had a Supreme Court um, case in literally in 2000, and it was called Grutter versus Bollinger, and then we have another one in 2010, and that's Fisher versus Austin. But those two Supreme Court cases sort of bring back the idea of the law and marry it to this idea of multi, of what we might call multiculturalism in that it says, right, we really have to think about that which is compliant, but we also have to think about culture and what's the rev relevance to culture and our organizational cultures. The other things that have begun to emerge are sort of three real areas, right? Most people really, when they think about diversity, they're thinking about re the representational, um, the categories. What we now know, of course, is that we also, there's a lot of uh, attention to diversity of thought, right, and this idea of diversity of thought. What I say here, and this is really important, is, right, thoughts, cognition, is formed by who we are. So sometimes now when we're talking about diversity of thought, sometimes people will act, act as if your thoughts happen over here, and then like your body's over here. But that's not actually how it works, <laughs> right? And what we know from good neuroscience and from cognitive science is that actually our thoughts are formed by the bodies that we're located in, the cultures in which we exist, and that too, right? So demography is also related to demography of thought, but, we, but sometimes I think when we think of diversity of thought, we just have to keep those things in mind. And then the question that has really become present, and I think this is key, is certainly in the United States, and this is out of the work of people like Scott Perry, Page or Dolly Chug, right? How do we leverage this work? What's the diversity quote unquote bonus, right? And how do we think about growth models? I have my little scale down there to di differentiate between equality and equity, but I'm assuming most people in this room know the differences. You can always ask me later. So what's driving changes? We have changes in migration. We have changes in generations, persons with disabilities, gender shifts. And so I just want to say here, I'm going to mention this survey a number of times during my talk. So we just did a survey at NYU, and it was called Being at NYU. And so this survey was a climate analysis of our climate at NYU. We had to collect about uh, a third of our, a uh, 30 percent of our population, which meant we collected responses from 21,699 people. 
Yes, it's a big data set. So we have qualitative and quantitative data from these individuals. What we learned from this data, and I'll just uh, suggest this, and I'm gonna say this now because um, it suggests something about the future of diversity and inclusion and belonging and equity. So we had a, 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 um, a consulting firm work with us to collect these data. These data, when we got them back, I, I was called, and they, the categories of gender. Right, so they said, well, Lisa, we need your help because you have 19 genders recorded that are statistically significant and you have 28 different categories for LGBTQ plus persons. So we had to create a whole new category called uh, uh, LGBTQ plus and trans spectrum, and then a gender spectrum. What this tells me about the future is that the category of gender is shifting. When we think about trans, when we think about non-binary, when we think about the X, we, this will change across time, and so will sexual identity and sexual orientation. We know with the millennials, we've seen some shifts, right? Millennials are 50% are, are of the workforce force as of tomorrow, literally in 2020, and then Generation Z, which is the uh, generation right below them, and then the alphas, we know that they are very different than the generations previously, and so the kinds of questions, et cetera, that they're asking are very different, and this will suggest changes to identity and identity categorizations. The benefits of diversity and inclusion work, I only include this to say that there is a lot of research that suggests what the benefits are and the return on investment and how it benefits not just companies but also uh, universities. The research is vast. I would like to say that um, the research that I'm going to talk about mostly today is some of the research on um, bias, which has to do with unconscious bias, and that's the work of Anthony Greenwald and Ma Mazarin Banaji. You see it there in the middle called Blind Spot. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. That obviously links to the work of Daryl Wing Su, who does work on microaggressions, and um, that work, of course, was un undergirded by the work of Claude Steele um, out of Stanford and uh, Berkeley on the stereotype threat, which was the earlier work in the earlier 90s. Of course, a lot of the work on intersectionality that has been embraced by a number of the human rights commissions and including the UN is based on the work of Kimberly Crenshaw, and that's the work of intersectionality. Uh, organizational design theory and design thinking, that has emerged a lot in the spaces of innovation and then thinking about how that uh, relates to diversity and inclusion efforts. And then you can see I have Scott Page's book there, uh, The Diversity bonus because a lot of people are talking about that kind of work now. And that piggybacks under the work of, per, of people like Dolly Chug, who um, that's all about how to create growth models in terms of diversity and inclusion. And those of you who are f familiar with Kenji Yoshini's work, of course, that also relates to bias and covering and particularly uh, identity formation. I'm not going to be talking so much about identity formation today, but you can ask me questions. So the implicit bias, I just want to make sure we're on the same, uh, same page. Implicit bias measures unconscious attitudes. These are things that we actually do without knowing we're doing them. Um, so usually this is when I give a little test and I say things like this, and I'll say cat, and then most people say cat. Dog, okay, so that's like the unconscious, right? So most people don't, you don't say cat and most people don't say building, right? They say cat, dog. Then you say tall, big, long, right? Short, some people are confused. They're like, I don't know, right? So, um, and then you get into cultural things, right? Please do not shout out anything here, okay? All right? So American, I'm in Canada. I know you all have some thoughts. Russian. In America right now, we have a lot of thoughts. <laughs> Harvard. When I was at Harvard, and when I went out at Harvard, people have a lot of thoughts about Harvard. So we have unconscious thoughts, we have conscious thoughts. Those thoughts that come to our heads right away, those are sort of the biases that we hold sometimes. Those are called schemas, right? And that's how we, we operationalize and, dis, and through the world. That's how we cognitively sort of organize the world, right? So when we're thinking about these schemas and these associations, what, and there's a woman by the name of Iris Bonet. She also works at Harvard. And so what Iris did was she took the work of Mazarin and, and Anthony Greenwald and said, well, how do we think about these biases, not just in terms of people, 
and individuals, but how do we think about it in terms of organizations, right? Because one of the things that we know, and we know this about organizational structures and organizational cultures, is we really do have to think about what feeds into your organizational structures, right? So what assumptions, what behaviors, how your culture is created through your leaders, how it's created in terms of the units, because organizational cultures are the values that contribute to the unique social and psychological environment of, uh, of an organization. So how that organization is gonna work. So then what we have to ask is what's in that collective gut? That image comes from MIT. So in every organization you have some bad things and some good things, bad bacteria and good bacteria. The question is how do you get rid of the bad bacteria and how do you grow the good bacteria? So part of what we have to do in our organizations is think is look at who we are. What's our local, what's our national, what's our international? How are we communicating who we are? And we know in the age of social media, this becomes really important because our reputations often are centered in how that social media and what our students are saying, what our deans are saying, what they're saying about our schools, our departments, what those uh, chronicles of education are saying, et cetera. So we, the external factors, the mission and strategy, organizational values, these all lead to not just the culture, but the biases that we have within our organizations. So the next things that we have to do are thinking about who are we as an organization. And so this is one of the things that I had to do as I went into NYU. So as you heard before, I was at Harvard. So I've been, and I was at Tufts, University, then I was at Harvard University, and now I'm at New York University. I say the things that they have in common is they are all decentralized universities and they all happen to be private. Other than that, they're a giraffe, an apple, and a, a podium. Like they have nothing in common, okay? In terms of how they operate, they are universities, but they have very little in common. So when I looked at the mission and strategy of a Harvard versus an NYU, very different of how they've been historically, what they've been able to do, what their leadership values are. Harvard was a very litigious environment. In other words, if you're gonna sue a university, lots of people would want to, to sue Harvard, right? And I didn't know that until I got there. It doesn't make it a bad place, it just means that that is part of the organizational culture, right? That's not the same at Tufts. Right, Tufts is not an institution that was very litigious. Does that make sense to people, sort of how organizations might differ? Okay, so then as you're thinking about an organization, then what we have to think about, particularly as we're thinking about how we are recruiting, promoting, and our climate and culture, we have to do what's called an organizational bias assessment and remediation. So literally, there are tools where you can look at your organization and say, what is at work within our organization, particularly in these areas of recruitment, promotion and retention, and climate and culture? Because that tells you who your organization is. So I'm gonna give you an example. I do a lot of consulting. So I was consulting with some bank, some banking organizations. And I said, so what's your strategy for promotion and retention? Silence in the room. And then eventually I see this one hand goes up and says, I say, okay, well, what, how's it work? And she says, well, if you can survive for over three years, you get promoted. <laughs> okay, good to know, right? So I now know that you have a survival strategy, right? That what works in your culture is navigating survival. But that's not the same across cultures. I don't know if that's good or bad, but you have to name it and identify what your culture is. Right? If you have a research culture, that's different than a teaching culture. And so you have to know where the rewards, the benefits, and the incentives lie, because that tells you something about then how people are measuring what goes forward and how people are measuring you. So when I was talking about that climate survey that we did at NYU earlier, right, that becomes crucial because we have lots of information about how people and what they think about our culture. Organizational culture and bias. Organizations have distinct needs and they are at play. There's this old adage, right, culture eats strategy. But culture eats people, right? You can be the strongest leader, the strongest person, and the culture will still eat you alive. 
right? So this, all this work, and you'll see this, uh, you see these um, new, um, these new strategies, particularly in Europe, to have women, to diversify boards, and you'll see these percentages, 30, 40 percent women on boards. Well, what we've learned from the research is you have to have at least three, usually, which leads to 30 percent, to change the culture of a board. Otherwise, if you just have one woman, one person of color, one religious minority, one member of an LGBTQ plus group on a board, they don't change the culture of the board, the board just eats them up. Does that make sense? So you need, right, what's called critical mass, that's what that is, that 30%, to actually change a culture and to change a strategy. That's where you get to transformation. All right. Now we're going to talk a little bit about transformation later, but I just want to get there in terms of when people are in groups, they tend to move and think together. So that means that even if you have a group that doesn't necessarily think together, if you put them in the group, they will. And that's how it can begin to eat even your strongest leaders. Often also when we're approaching diversity and inclusion work, what we can do is we can have it sort of atomized. So we were talking about this a little bit earlier. So what will happen is you have different diversity and inclusion programs in different places. They're not really aligned or connected. Then you have these things that sort of emerge. So you'll have a problem here or a problem there, and then it's treated as atomized. This is often the approach in universities across the board. It's not, a, it, in a, and this is some, to some degree what we've inherited. Some of this is also, also fiscal, because there are often fiscal challenges in universities in terms of who, what, who owns what. What I argue is that you have to move to an integrated model. There has to be a model of integration. Now, that's not centralization. I, as I said, have worked at very decentralized institutions. Centralization is different than integration. Integration means that you come up with a strategy that actually allows for quality control and for the proliferation of information in a systemic and, system, systemic and systematic manner. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about what I mean there, and I'm going to give you an example of what we've done at NYU. So you can see, right, you can have a crisis, but that crisis then falls within in the, the planning that you've already have ongoing. And the planning that you want to start with, you want to start with strategy teams and centers of education. So one of the things when I came into NYU I, and I, when I came into Harvard, I had to do these kinds of organizational analyses that I talked about before. So I used some of the tools that you, I already provided earlier. And then I had to say, well, what's the difference across these cultures? So at NYU, one of the things that I learned early on is that NYU is a highly adaptive culture. It kind of, it breathes, it breathes like New York City. In other words, I can say something and it can happen. And I'm going to give you very concrete examples now. So when I was at Harvard, one of the things that I said we needed to do was across all of the schools, we needed to hire inclusion officers because we needed resident and local expertise within the schools. We then developed two task forces, we developed some research projects, and over the course of six years, we were able to develop that, and across the schools, we hired various diversity officers and implemented that strategy. At NYU, I've been at NYU two years. I said that the first month I was there, and three months later, Almost all the schools had diversity officers and were trying to hire them, and they were moving very rapidly. And so I had a different issue. I then had to wrap around and think about how do I bring these officers together so we have the right quality controls, as opposed to Harvard, where we started with the research in the beginning. Does that make sense? Different environments, different approaches. I'll give you another concrete example. Inclusion, diversity, and belonging. Belonging is a word that comes out of social psychology. It's a new word to think about how we think about um, environments and, cult and climates. So when I got to NYU, very few people were familiar with this um, nomenclature. I started using the nomenclature. I literally walked by a window three months later, and it said, do you belong here? I was like, I don't know. Do we even know what that word means? So, so I'm just saying, like, you have to think about your culture and the delivery models because how that gets delivered in your culture will matter. Um, and, and again, framing matters as well. So one of the other things that I've, I will say, and you'll hear me say this um, throughout this presentation, is 
often also diversity and inclusion, belonging and equity efforts can be framed as a problem that we need to solve. And I would like to suggest that we frame it as an asset and an opportunity that we can grow with. Because I think if you frame something as a problem, what do you get? A problem. If you frame something as an asset, you get an asset. So moving to a global inclusion, strength-based advantage model means you shift from crisis to a systems model. You elevate advantage to strength-based models, and then you think about your spheres of influence and consultation. What do you do best, and what do you do not so well? So again, I'm gonna use NYU. I had to think, what did NYU do well as I went in? I studied the institution. What did it do well and what could I leverage that was different than my Harvard experience or my Tufts experience? Not that those experiences were bad. I, you know, you leverage different things at different institutions. But at NYU, I noticed this nugget of innovation and entrepreneurship. And what I realized later was that NYU produces, their students produce more businesses than any school in the country, right? So it has more entrepreneurs and more innovation than MIT. That's a phenomenon. So then, what do I also know? I know the technology companies, I know the corporations, and I know countries are struggling in the space of innovation. Because do we have the right diversity to innovate appropriately, right? If we're gonna solve the water crisis in South Africa or in the Middle East, do we have the right people at the table? If we're gonna solve right, the plastics crisis of the world, do we have the right people at the table? And what we know is we need men, we need women, we need people across cultures, et cetera. So then I thought, oh yes. So my title is gonna be Inclusion, Diversity, and Innovation. Bringing together right, what is key at NYU. Right? I would not necessarily have had that title at my previous institutions, because that's not the nugget. At Harvard, I'm, it was research, right? A research in executive ed and leadership. Does that make sense? So really thinking about how you marry your work with what the mission, remember that, that slide where I talked about mission and strategy of the organization? What's the mission and strategy of your organization must be tied to the mission and strategy of your inclusion and equity issues. And then you have to think about what the trends are, right? And the trends we know in terms of innovation and, te and technology, et cetera, we know if we create algorithms with bias, that bias will lead us right into the future, and we're seeing it right now. So we have to think about AI and robotics in different ways because we don't want it to look like it does now. So the other ways in which I like to talk about this is sometimes, right, diversity and inclusion work can be siloed, and I, I think that's a problem. So uh, Pricewater Cooperhouse, um, some of you may have known, they've taken up quite the diversity and inclusion platform. And so they have something called the total impact analysis. In other words, how does diversity and inclusion, belonging and equity, impact your entire right, functioning of your organization? Everything from payroll to profits to investments. So when I, sometimes people ask me why I report to the president. Because diversity and inclusion touches all aspects of the institution. It, 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 it touches alumni giving. It, it touches our legal footprint. It touches our students. It touches our faculty. It touches our employees. Every fabric of the institution. And so when we're talking about diversity, inclusion, belonging, and equity, we have to think about the total impact analysis, which means we also have to think about the fiscal and financial alignment, right? What, where the costs are and where we're going to grow. So one of the things I did at Tufts and at Harvard, and I did this, and I was talking about this earlier with, um, with the deans, is with the deans, I would take them aside and monetize the costs of diversity, inclusion, belonging, and equity. Because there's a way to monetize those costs, to think about what it's costing you as a school, but also to analyze what you can grow and how you can grow. So one of the things we're doing at NYU right now is I'm partnering with two big organizations, two big companies. Because what I realized is we are underfunded at NYU, we have a low endowment and our research funding is lower than some of the institutions that I've worked for previously. 
right? Well, I saw this as an opportunity to then grow funding for scholarships and also for our research for our faculty, research dollars for our faculty, because, right, if you do a total impact analysis, then you see that those are the growth areas and those are the areas where actually then I can bring in the right partners. Does that make sense? So then to do that means you have to look at the organization in totality. We're gonna come back and ask questions. Some people will ask me about this idea of employee resource groups, and I bring this up because when we're thinking about leveraging our talent within our organization, we do have to think about how we recreate we create groups that allow us to do that. Employee or what we some people call business or university resource groups, college and university resource groups can be really crucial in that work. I think the key here though is that just like you might have an LGBTQ plus group, far too often we don't go far enough. We have these identity-based groups, but what we really need are groups that are also based on thought. So you see I have their sustainability, parents, you have to have groups in STEM, because these are also groups that will help within the university structure to move the work of diversity, inclusion, belonging, and equity throughout the organization. Organizational best practices. So I'll, I'll pause here for a moment and just say um, some of the work, so some people, and this was alluded to, why do you need a diversity officer or manager? Why do you need a person to lead this work? And I often say um, my hair is really, really white, really, really, really white, really. I'm going to retire like tomorrow. And so um, that's why I just say that because I'm really old and like it's a really good dye job. But um, I've been at this work a long time, so it's not to keep myself employed, right? Like I know, I know what I'm doing next. And so, but the but, but I liken this to technology, right? So in the old days, right, people were like, we don't need someone to be the head of technology for our institution. We can just have all these people have computers and it's going to work out. It didn't work out. It didn't work out because we didn't know what we're doing, <laughs> right? We know so because we have high level and low level efficiencies with technology, right? Some of us know how to use it really well. I come from a computer science background. I know how to use technologies pretty well, but however, the less I use them, the less familiar I am, right? Some people have low level use and knowledge. That's the same thing in diversity, inclusion, belonging, and equity work. Some people have high level knowledge and some people have lower level knowledge. And you need someone, an architect, to help right, scaffold, create the structures, and then create opportunities for people to move through that. Just like you need an architect of technology, because if you're using Apple and PCs, you need someone to help right, make those translations make sense. Right, so I use that to say you just you have to have that management piece, just like you have HR, just like you have other management areas. You need that that skill base. You also have to be able to create cultures of debate, and so we were talking about this earlier. And so, how do you create cultures of uh, where people can have actually conversations that are hard? Because the, the difference between diversity, inclusion, and equity, and belonging, and technology is technology is hard, but people don't bring as many emotions to the subject as they do to diversity, inclusion, belonging, and equity. It brings up people's uh, pasts, people's histories, all kinds of things to the table. So you have to create uh, strategies. We have something called the Carter Center in um, the United States, which is based on the work of Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter was one of our presidents. Uh, he actually... Um, people critique that he might have not been the best president, but what he actually was able to do was to keep us out of war and actually to bring uh, many countries together. At the Carter Center, they have a, a curriculum about critical conversations and the engagement of difference. At NYU, we're taking that curriculum and adapting it to NYU and writing our own curriculum so that we have the right curriculum for us to think about how we engage those conversations. Um, I'm not going to go through all of the rest of these. The only other part I'm going to say in terms of thinking about organizational strategic best practices are cohort hires, and I cannot say enough about this. And that, again, goes back to that critical mass and creating critical mass. Uh, I'm going to skip that slide. So again, when we're thinking about changing a culture, I always like to give examples because sometimes people say, can you change a culture? What does it look like to transform a culture? Well, if we think about litter, Right. So I um, actually, my family is from New York City. I didn't grow up in New York City, but I'm, I spent a lot of time in New York City as a child. And if, uh, anybody who's got, who was in New York City in the 60s and 70s, it was very um, unclean. 
There were lots, there was lots of writing. I, I sort of miss it sometimes, to be honest, but there was lots of graffiti on the subways, trash everywhere. It was, it was not, it was not great in lots of ways, right? And now we look at New York City and, and we look at just the United States in general, and we see a lot of cleaning, right? And what has happened is the, the idea of how, what, what we do with trash has changed. So I like to use this, 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 uh, this idea of recycling. So now everybody, we're supposed to recycle, right? So what happens if you have that bottle in your hand and you're in the airport? This just happened to me yesterday. So I had the bottle, the, I drank the water, I had the bottle in my hand, and I was walking toward the wrong trash can. And I got the look of recycling shame. Right? That people are looking at me like, is she going to do it? <laughs> and I was like, no, oh, I just realized my mistake because of your looks. Right? And then I go to the, right, to the blue bin. Right? But I'm saying, right, we've not just changed behavior, we've changed the policing of that behavior. Right? So changed culture and then how we imagine what should be done. Similarly with technology, right? I say I have like five iPhones, iPads, etc. We have changed how we think we, it, what it means to be connected. I'm not, whether we agree with it or not, we have changed socially and culturally many, many how we think we should be connected. Does everyone buy into that? Not necessarily, but we know that this is something that is actually in debate. Okay. Uh, I always like to, you know, so use a little quote. So I think we have to stay with the questions longer when we're thinking about diversity and inclusion. So one of the things that, w that we have to ask is, and I think that we have to ask this, I'm about to uh, turn to sort, sort of thinking about what it means to be an effective leader in these spaces, is we actually have to think about what does it mean to be included and excluded? And so we have to think about that in very real ways. What does it mean for people, individuals to feel included and excluded? And what does it mean for our organizations to do that? When we're mitigating bias and we're thinking about mitigating bias, there are really five forms of bias. Um, you can see there overconfidence, anchoring, confirmation, availability, and representative, representative. What I like to say is often these biases, what people, how they like to identify them is through individuals. And where I'd like to take you is for you to think about them as organization, organizational biases. How can an organization be overconfident? What does that look like? I think it looks like you think you're the best school in the world. You don't have any problems. Anchoring bias. We know that because we've always been that way. Confirmation. Well, the research supports it because we did the research. <laughs> right? So really think about how the organization operationalized those types of biases. They can be operationalized, yes, in terms of right, searches and things like that. And we see that in the search processes. And certainly you probably have seen some of this before in terms of how do you mitigate search in biases, I mean in search processes, as you're hiring faculty or deans. But again, think about it in terms of the organization and what does that mean and how does it get played out. I'm going to come back to that. So when we're thinking about DNI competency and leadership development, what does it mean to successfully move across difference? And how do we build awareness in our organizations? What does administrative management look like? How do we think about organizational and team and unit departmental engagement and operational DNI? Now, cultural competence in the old days used to mean that we could be competent of all cultures. Right, there was this idea, yeah, I already see some of you shaking your head, it's ridiculous, right? Like, I mean, you can be alive a long time and study cultures and never learn every culture. That's just not a good idea. So instead, right, moving toward thinking about what is the culture in which you exist, how does that manifest itself upon and with other cultures? That's the awareness piece. Right? So I, I said this earlier to the team, uh, to some of the people I was talking about, talking with. So I work at a campus that has, glo we have global campuses. We have campus in Shanghai. We have three degree ranking campuses. So you can actually enroll in, at NYU and never go to New York City. 
literally. You can just go to Abu Dhabi and then go to Shanghai or go to LA. We have a campus in LA, NYU LA, and NYU DC. So, so, so the question is, right, then what does that mean in terms of the educational um, awareness? And so part of what I have to ask my question is, if we're creating global citizens, what is that going to look like? And what is that going to mean in terms of the meaning of what, if it, what does it mean to operationalize diversity and inclusion in a global space? So I had to ask my site directors. And so I said, so we have to understand who we are as an organization. So we just had a meeting of all of the people who direct all our sites. And one of the things I asked was I said, OK, I have a question for you. Because they said, well, what do you think about NYU? You've been here. At that point, it was a year and a half. And I said, well, this is what I think. I think, I have a question, are we an American university with global underpinnings? Are we a global university with an American beginning? Right? Very distinct. Now the room erupted, of course, and they wanted me to answer the question. I said, I'm not gonna answer that question. That's not why, I said, it's the question of where we are. We're on a journey, right? We started as an American institution with these, these campuses. And we're moving to becoming a global institution, right? And the part of that is because we decided to set up these campuses with, in partnership with the local communities as opposed to just setting up satellite sites, right? We actually work with the governments and we have these missions and strategies where we have to have a thousand visitors on our campuses every month to make sure that we're integrating with the local, right? But those are the kinds of strategies that we put into place, and that's the operationalizing of that. But you have to think about, it's not just awareness, it's how, you, how are you managing it, and how are you operationalizing it. Effective hiring strategies, because I didn't want to leave that off, it was in my title, so a title of my talk, and good, I don't want to miss, miss that. So as we're thinking about organizational strategies, we do have to think about how those get embedded into our hiring strategies. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I just would like to say that if you're, when, you're, when we're doing hiring, the best way to hire is to do it in groups, not one-on-one. -on -one. You want group interviewing. You also want to have mentoring and coaching in place and you, for the committees and references. I cannot say enough about references. I'm going to send a video back that I'm not going to play today, but I'll send this video back to you all. It's from The Ohio State University. It talks a little bit about uh, the um, hiring practices. But references and what we know about references and letters of references, particularly in higher education, is that these are really where the rubber meets the road. And particularly when we think about things, so I'm going to give you an example of gender. So we have what, uh, what gender-coded language, right? And so as we write letters of recommendation, because so many of us are just socialized in this way, this is not, not, this is not critical of anyone, what can happen is this is how we describe men. He's a leader for the 22nd century. He will lead research efforts and guide us in ways that no person has ever seen before. We respect him and cannot believe that he has not already had this job. And when he gets it, he will only be at it for a short period of time because he will be chair and then president. <laughs> She's a delightful person. In fact, when she met my wife, it was really wonderful. They got along really well. And she's collaborative. She's really collaborative and friendly. Her research demonstrates that, collaboration. She's a leader of influence, and I really like her. Now, I've exaggerated, obviously, right? But what we know from research is women get coded with softer skills, right? The way they get written about is just softer in general, and men harder qualities get associated with them. When we get these letters of recommendation, right, and there, uh, um, uh, there are these companies now that are actually using algorithms to try, you've probably heard of this, right, to look at these letters of recommendation to try to de-bias, right, and there's lots of problems with the algorithms, so we gotta figure that out. But I'm just saying to you all to think about those letters of recommendation and think about how you're using them in your process of hiring, because that's often where the rubber, as I said, meets the road. <laughs> 
Uh, retention and development, mentorship and sponsorship, mentoring and sponsoring are the number one ways to keep your faculty and staff, et cetera. If you can develop mentor, robust mentoring and sponsorship programs, we know this and this works across organizations, whether it's corporations or universities. Um, so I just that's just a helpful hint. Leaders and managers, you really need to develop some kind of process that lets people know the difference between management and leadership, right? And those are two distinct qualities, and you need both, right? And a lot of us are really effective leaders. A lot of us are really effective managers. Very few of us are good at both, right? And you have to know where you're not good, because then you have to figure out who you need to hire to actually strengthen what are your team, et cetera. So, so we use a model of, let me just see what time it is, so I'm gonna stop talking, I'll stop talking soon, okay. So we use a model of design thinking at, uh, at NYU, and I really, um, I really started to embrace this model because it really maps on very well, both to innovation, and you know in a lot of innovation spaces they use design thinking, and then of course in the diversity and inclusion space. And I say part of that is because it starts with the idea of empathy. Right? And what we also know is design thinking maps onto research. So what's the best of higher education? Research. Because what do we know from science? We need to ideate, we need to define, we need to test, we need to do the prototypes, right? So we know that. So this model works very well in thinking about how do we advance these efforts. When we move to the six C's of inclusive leadership, I'm sure some of you have seen this before, cognizance, curiosity, courage, commitment, collaboration, and cultural intelligence. Really thinking about then how do you employ, right? The design thinking model of thinking, okay, how are you gonna be cognizant? When, you're empathy, when you use empathy, how do you actually employ cognizance, curiosity? What does that mean in terms of your collaborative efforts? Inclusive leadership, um, we actually have developed a program at NYU called our Global Inclusive Management Institute. We have piloted that and we're turning it into an executive education model. And exact, we're doing exactly that, teaching leaders how to be effective managers and then how to be effective leaders in this space. And I'm gonna give you a couple of examples. So the first thing we talk about is, the first thing to be an effective leader is you have to know what triggers you. What are your triggers? What are your areas that are not necessarily your strong areas? Um, and you can use things like the implicit association test. So there are these tests that you can actually take. They're at the, Har at the Harvard Project, Project Implicit. So people will take those tests in terms of thinking about bias. But the second thing I, th I say is you have to think about who you, who you are psychologically. So I'll give you an example. I'm telling you something about myself. So I'm a person who was an, was an introvert. Like I'm a classic academic, you know, with my books. Just me and my books, just me and my books, love it. And so, but then as I started to become a leader, right, I noticed that I had a tendency, well I didn't notice, other people noticed, that I had a tendency when I would walk into a room to walk and talk to just two people, right? Because I'm an introvert, so that's my comfort zone, right? I actually don't like room. <laughs> Right, my comfort zone is not rooms of hundreds of people. That's not, and I did. I wasn't, you know, when they talk about go out and network. I was like, I didn't even know what that meant. Right, go out and meet all these people. Why? Why would I want to do that? Okay, so, <laughs> yeah. So as I became a leader, though, what I realized and what other people pointed out was that if I went into the room and only talked to one or two people, people began to think those were my favorite people. That I didn't like other people. It wasn't that I didn't like them. It was that I didn't know them. It was that I was a little afraid. <laughs> like that was my own issue, right? It wasn't other people's issue. So then I had to figure out what signals I was sending as a leader that were in that those were signals that I didn't mean to send, right? If I walk into the office after a weekend and talk to one person and not another person, I don't that's not favoritism. It's just like I have something may have something on my mind and I'm super geeky, so I might just be tunnel focused, right? So that's the kind of thing, right, to understand. So I had to understand, I'm kind of nerdy. I'm kind of, right, I had to really embrace that and say, not just nerd girl, like rock, rock, but what does that mean in terms of my leadership? How does that get played out? Because if I'm gonna create psychological trust with the people with whom I work, we have to know who we are as leaders. We also have to generate the conditions for leadership for others. How am I tapping other people and how am I making that a system versus an old boy or old girls network? 
Again, emphasis on mentorship and sponsorship, thinking about skills and learning, and enacting positive and upstander behavior. This is key because leaders want People who watch you are watching you as a leader, but they're also watching you with other leaders. So I'll give you an example. If you're a leader and you see bad leadership behavior and you don't do anything or say anything or make any comments, then people begin to think that you're not as strong a leader as they originally thought. Right, so an acting positive upstander and, and bystander behavior becomes crucial to leadership. In terms of accelerating innovation, I'm ending here. We need this alignment, as I've sort of already talked about. So thinking about your system alignment, what are you doing in terms of leadership and training? That's where I, you know, ending. Cross-sector partnerships, innovation and sustainability, research, bonus, and growth, right? I talked about what's your organizational culture, how are you using your research, and what are your bonus and growth areas? If you can identify that in your organization, then you can figure out what partnerships, you can figure out how to innovate, and you can figure out what your leadership and training mod modules should be. Inclusive uh, uh, innovation, it will be disruptive. And so the question is, and so I have a former president, and he used to do this. He used to put his finger in the air. And every time he did it, it frightened me a little bit. But he would say, I'm, I'm testing the winds of change. And so I say this. 20%, 15 to 20% of the people don't, are not gonna like the change that you're doing because 80, over 80% 80 of people don't like change at all. Okay. So this is something I learned. I learned this from my HR partner at, 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 at Harvard, actually. I was really old when I learned this. And she was sitting there and she said, well, you know, 80, I think she was 88% of people don't like change, only 6% of people like, cha you know, uh, even want change a little bit, and only 4% of people like change at all. And I was like, what? I was like, I'm in another minority group? Are you kidding me? <laughs> so, right, so we really have to think about, right, most people do not like change. And so if we're trying to change things, right, if you have 15 to 20 percent of people are disgruntled, that probably means you're in the sweet spot of good change. If you have 40 to 50 percent of people, that's not a sweet spot. <laughs> you need to adjust, right? But if you don't have anyone who's disgruntled, then you're probably not pushing the envelope. Right? And we know this from good science. Good science always pushes the envelope. Not too much. You don't want to blow up the lab, right? You want to push it enough to see where you can go. I end with this because these are two of my favorite quotes. Uh, one is by uh, Lil Watson. If you come here to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you come here because your liberation is bound up with mine, then we can work together. And that's what we have to do in our organizations is really work together. And the world is before you. You need not take it as little bit as you when you came in because we can work together to change all parts of an organization from top to bottom. I was talking about this earlier. The middle can be the hardest to, to change. But if we work together and think about the strategies that are systemic and systematic, we can leave the world and our organizations different. Thank you. Dr. Coleman, thank you so very much for that riveting and exciting presentation. I've taken so many uh, new messages and new learnings, um, whether it's uh, thinking about organizational bias and how that can manifest, and as well as the steps taken to mitigate and eliminate um, uh, these type of biases in the work that we do as we continue on our journey here at the University of Toronto. So I'd like to open up the floor to anyone, whether present within this space or via our live stream. So for those uh, uh, joining us online, you can email anti-racism, A-N-T-I-R-A-C-I-S-M, at utoronto.ca, your questions. That is, the email is on the slide right now. And we have a staff member who will be uh, uh, collating them and will be giving them to me throughout the Q&A session. And we'll try our best to get to some of them. But for now, I'd like to open up the floor to anyone here in the room who may have a question. Oh, OK. And again, for the Q&A session, we're reminding folks to please use the microphone so that the folks um, online and within the room can hear. Hi, um, well, I'll just stand. Well, first of all, I'm from engineering, so this is how we typically roll for Halloween, so <laughs> happy Halloween, everyone. Oh, thank you. 
Um, I just have a quick question about how, how do you institutionally define goal, diversity goals as a means of reaching critical mass to drive um, inclusion, belonging, um, and equity? And so, for example, an, like an academic institution like U of T and other institutions, how do you go forward and say, okay, our goals for diversity, should they be, be defined by, okay, the city that we're in. So um, do we want proportional representation, relative, like analogous to the population? So if it's 8.5% black, do we want 8.5% black students here in the faculty? Or is it should it be defined nationally, which is, again, different in the Canadian context, like three and a half? Like, should the, how, should a, how should an institution go forward in trying to define those diversity goals? That's the first question. And then the second question would be, if now if you have these diversity goals, how, what are the mechanisms that faculties, that departments should use when, when dealing with admission for, as a weighted criterion for, for hiring or for admission? So if we say we want a diverse cohort, right, but then there's a disconnect because we say we value diversity, we celebrate diversity, we want diversity, but then there's no way on the application uh, like, we don't collect that data. So you're saying, for example, you want it to be blind, but then if you want it to be blind, but then you want to celebrate diversity, how do I, like, how do I measure, like, how do I show that I value diversity, right? And how do I weigh that versus any other criterion, right? And how do you, yeah, how do you, how do, you do that? Okay. That's, yeah. guys, my two questions. Yeah. So, okay, so I'm going to answer this question in a couple of different ways. So in terms of defining the goals, um, the goals, the goals, def okay, so in the United States, how we have defined goals has been based very much on labor market pools. And those labor market pools are then based on your local labor market. So, and that's been policy, right? That's been federal policy. So then universities are what are called federal contractors. And so they receive dollars, federal dollars. And when you receive federal dollars, which all universities in the United States do, you receive federal dollars, even if you're a private institution, you have to file these reports to the federal government that tell certain things about your hiring practices, and that's also related to your state. Okay, so 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 then to your your question about whether it's 8.5 or 3.5, it would be 8.5 in the case of if it was New York City or something like that. Um, if you're thinking about the state, now what we know though is that's often not enforced. Okay, um, we have this uh, new president. You all may have heard about him. Um, and so what happens is that can get enforced through these federal agencies and then the federal agencies then it's enforced at the local level. And so what we're seeing is a, a lack of enforcement across those levels. All right, so that's what we're seeing in certain areas. And then we've seen, you probably all have seen some of the legislations where states are then repealing some of that. So that's actually how it has gotten operationalized. But what universities and sort of corporate cultures will do is they will set their own goals. And so those goals will be based usually on three factors. One can be sort of labor market pools. The second is what we call gap area analyses. So you do some kind of analysis of your organization and you notice a significant gap area. Like we haven't had any women in science in 15 years. You have a gap, right? So you need to think about that, right? And so then you start to put practices into place. The third is actually it's a growth area. So you know that you're, uh, in our case, let's say we know we're going to be in Abu Dhabi, so we know that we want to at least have X percentage enrollment of Emirati because as we roll out there, we don't want to have um, underrepresentation in that area, right? So those are usually the three ways in which then things people will think about a mission-focused goal. And that's what you're seeing. And then in Europe, what you're seeing are quotas. They're installing quotas for boards, and so they're saying you have to reach 30% or you have to reach 40%. So it, it depends on where you are, country, in terms of how that gets established, and then um, also what your state and uh, federal policies are. And your second question um, around um, how to utilize. So this is where I would say you can utilize those goals, but I actually think that that's fine. I mean, I think using compliance and using quotas and using goals is, you know, that's fine. But I don't, it's necessary, but it's not sufficient. And it's not going to get you where you want to go. You're not going to change culture with changing policy. 
right? Culture doesn't, policy doesn't change culture. So you actually have to think about how are you changing culture. So, so, so before when I was talking about when I went into NYU, right, NYU did not have a robust language necessarily around diversity, inclusion, belonging, and equity in terms of it being streamlined, right? They had it sort of atomized across the schools. So part of what I had to do was figure out how to make that streamline. So how do you go from one minute from me talking about these words and then them being on a window? Well, that's a culture change. Right, and that culture change happened really rapidly. Well, how I was able to do that was not by saying, well, these are the policies. I said, this is the future. And do you want to be in the future, or do you want to be in the past? And what I know is that my faculty, I mean, I don't know what your faculty want. I know what my faculty want, so you'd have to figure out what your faculty want. But our faculty want more research dollars. They want more opportunities for their research to grow. And so I was like, that I can deliver on, because diversity and inclusion and all these companies, that's what they want. And so when I married those two things, that's about a culture change. That's not policy. And so that's where I would say, if you're thinking about strategically thinking about how do you uh, create your goals, think about culture goals and not compliance goals. You need compliance goals, but they're not going to lead you to where you need to, where you're going to where you're going to ultimately need to go. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. I'm going to quote one of your former bosses, Professor Faust from Harvard. Uh, in her final convocation speech, she said, when she was at the Boston Marathon and the terrorist act happened, she noticed that there were people who were civilians who were running towards where the attacks happened and not running from. And she said that's what leadership's about. To your point, there's some people that like change. There's some people who, who run towards the question of inclusion. Talk to us about how do we incentivize the ones who are afraid of the unknown. So thank you for that question, because this is scary, right? The world is changing, and change is scary. So when I, I used to have a map, and it was a map that talked about how the world is changing. And I stopped showing the map, because when I would look at my audience, I was like, oh my goodness, I'm not trying to frighten people. Right, and so, but the world is changing. It's changing in terms of demography. It's changing in terms of migratory patterns. It's shifting in terms of what, how we think about sustainable cultures, right? And so, and so I think that the way to start to try to talk about this, and that's why I just talked about the bonus model, right? Because often what we've, how we talk about it is, the world is changing, what are we gonna do? Right, how are we gonna deal with this? And it's almost the crisis of diversity, right? But it's not a crisis. It's a question of how are we gonna live together in better ways? And what we know is we've seen more right marriages across race. We've seen shifts in gender. We're seeing this with Generation Z and the and millennials and the alphas. And the reality is, if we want our children, and many of us want our children to grow up in a better world than we grew up in, then how do we make that possible, right? And so I think to actually the outreach is to outreach to individuals to say, Look, we might not agree, because I don't agree with a lot of people, but what we, might, what we might agree on, because at least in the university structure often, we agree that we want better research. We agree that we want better education. That we can agree on. So then how do we get to that, right? And that means you might have to change just this much. Not as much as I'm going to change, right? but you might have to change just a little bit. So how do we think about talking about change in 5%, 10%, 20 30 50%? And I think that is much more doable, right? So I, actually, when I talked about with going around and meeting with my deans individually, uh, particularly when I first got to Harvard, right, I would talk to them about how we were gonna do change at their school, right? And change at the business school was totally different, right, than change at the School of Arts and Sciences. Right? <laughs> the, you know? Right? So that's just to talk about then the culture, how we're going to do that. And I said to arts and sciences, we're only going to change 5% this year. To business, I said, we're going to change 15 to 20% because you're ready. Right? And so that's, I think, we have to think about. Now, that doesn't mean we're all getting to 100% change, but it, we have to think about how we're going to get there across time. And that's the courage factor. And I think as a leader, you have to be courageous also to be enough to be patient, right? Because some leaders, we gravitate toward leadership because we are impatient. <laughs> 
We want things to change. I'm one of those people I know, right? I work with a lot of those people. But we also have to sit in the sight of patience because not everyone, and we have to be a follower sometimes too. Thank you. I think we have a question from somebody. Oh, oh I think she's coming around. Oh, OK, we'll take one question from here. Then I'll, come to you. I'll try to talk back. So I'm talking from a position that's in a very interesting place in culture. So I currently work for a local school board in a role trying to create change, bringing in more indigenous, uh, Aboriginal, you know, American Indian elements within our school board. And we're kind of stuck because we can find people who are qualified within their communities to provide the types of learning and instruction. Um, but in trying to bring them into the organization, which is a colonial model, we are running into the issues of the culture um, where we have people who are very nice and say they want to help us with change, uh, but that there's so many rules and pieces to that overriding culture that don't allow us to bring those things in. I'm curious what your thoughts might be about trying to produce some of those changes. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, so yes, so one of the reasons I focus so much on culture at the beginning is because that's exactly right, right? Culture is really hard to change and we can say all kinds of things. So there are a couple ways that we can think about changing culture. One is, um, so the one is a, a process of experimentation. So one of the things, when I talked about that Global Inclusive Management Leadership Institute that we created, part of the reason I brought that up is that was a pilot within the organization. Because I didn't know what leadership was at NYU. I had just gotten there, right? So I needed some kind of pilot to tell me a little bit about what the organization looked like but while simultaneously sort of testing the boundaries. So we created a pilot internal to the organization that built in some of the leadership modules that already existed, and then some that we brought in from other, and I've been working with the Maori in New Zealand a lot, so bringing in some of the, some of the influences in terms of how do you transform culture, right? And so thinking about that. Now, the first class wasn't that great. The second class was better. Right? And we're now able to morph, and it's become so popular, people within the organization want to take it, and it's changing how they're thinking about leadership. So I've had the entire finance team. Once you get the finance team, I'm telling you, they were like, can we take the class, Lisa? I was like, oh my goodness, yes. Right? And so that's why to develop the right pilot model sometimes can be effective. Okay. The second is, if you can't create a pilot, because sometimes that means additional resources or something like that. The other is to create what is called an ambassador group, right? So this is a model, this is a group of leaders or people within the organization who form some kind of, you know, mini task force, committee, whatever that is. And then you begin to do your own organizational analytics to figure out what, where the areas are, the gap areas that you can actually identify to bring someone in. Because there's some place, a gap, where you can begin to think, this person could be successful in this way. And what I mean, and so I'll be very concrete. So when I was at uh, Tufts University, right, um, Tufts was, uh, was going through a, um, a personality change in a lot of ways and moving from one type of institution to another. And, and part of that was the, the global piece. And so what I, I was trying to bring in more people to work with me outside of, from different co countries. But, but because it was in Boston, because it had reputation, it, it was just really hard. So then what I did was create a leadership team of people, some people who had come in from other countries, you know, historically. We created a leadership team. We were able to identify one internship where we were able to then say we've identified two people we think could be successful over time and little by little then we were able to change the, the idea of what leadership was going to look like in the organization okay and then I'll say finally the third way is much more disruptive and that's you know um, that really is galvanizing some part of the organization usually it's the bottom of the organization to really put pressure on the organization um, and sometimes that's alumni constituencies sometimes that's the bottom of the organization but then to put pressure on the organization in terms of organizational culture that is a reputational piece and sometimes that can be external and work very effectively but again that's that has to be very strategic that's very strategic and sometimes that's not planned right that just sort of happens so we have time for about two, maybe three more questions, depending on length and scope. So I'd like to move to one of the questions that's Be come faster. from. Yes. 
that's come from our online community. <clears throat> So after having increased uh, a diverse representation within a department, uh, what are some of the mechanisms or infrastructures that the department can take to ensure either the students, staff, or faculty feel a sense of belonging in that space? Okay, yes. So first let me just say what I think belonging is so we have a good idea what that is. So sometimes people think that belonging means everybody gets along, and that's not right. So belonging means that you, it, it can be a space of contestation, but you don't get kicked out of the space. So I use a music analogy, like you, like you, you're you're at your high school dance or something, and, and that for the last you know ten years they've played salsa music, and you walk in and you say, "I'd like to hear some reggae or something like that," right? And when you say that, they don't kick you out, right? They actually start a conversation with you, right? So belonging is really about that some people have always belonged, and then how do you bring those people who haven't belonged, and how do you create those cultures of debate and contestation where people can really feel like they can then have a voice? Okay, so how do you do that? You actually then actually right, demonstrate that as a leader, right? You ask for constructive feedback. You ask for the difficult, right? I remember the first time I put a suggestion box in the front of my office, like a literal box. The people in my, all my team was like, all right, what, take that away. And I was like, no, because we're gonna get some feedback. And some of it's gonna be horrible. Right? Some of it's not gonna be good. Some of it's gonna be really unflattering. Right? But we have to be, as leaders, think about how are we soliciting that feedback? And then once we get the feedback, how are we putting it back out? Because if you get feedback and then you don't give, give some people answers, then it just looks like it's going into a black hole. The last thing I'll say about that is mentorship and sponsorship, which I said earlier, and creating robust programs both at the local and university level are key. But being an effective leader and creating good followership is, is the number one, number one thing, and understanding your own triggers and your organizational triggers. Thank you. Joyce, you will have the final question. Uh, so you mentioned, um, you know, having worked for decentralized universities, and I'd say U of T is certainly very decentralized, and I'd say decentralization within decentralization, it feels sometimes. Um, and if I look in the room, we have, you know, HR and governance and enrollment and admin and student service. And unfortunately, not everyone can be here, so not everyone can hear how important this message is, the need for change. Um, so because there are different levels within the organization, within the organization, what can some of us who might be more of the ground level um, say to ensure that we can be part of that change, um, be held accountable for our role in it, and as well as what can we do to hold some of the more seniors in senior level um, executives, managers in the room to hold them accountable? How are you held accountable uh, when you were doing some of the work in your previous roles? So one of the things that I, I do, I, I actually create committees to hold me accountable. So I actually literally have committees of like 30 people here, 30 people there across my organization. And when I first started creating these committees, everyone thought I, again, was insane. But I was like, we need the feedback because I don't work you know, I don't work all across the organization. So the first thing I say is create the right committees, and that's why I even brought up employee resource groups, is to create those. Some of those can be organic, right, in the organization, and then some of them can be more uh, more formalized. You know, in organizations, and to your point, and again, I was talking about this earlier, is there's something, on a, a friend of mine, uh, Shelly Zalis, she uh, started using this concept called the messy middle, right? So the you have the bottom of the organization and the top of the organization. So the top of the organization, usually there are people like me sending all these messages, and whether they actually proliferate through the organization, who knows. And then you have the bottom of the organization, and somehow, often, the top and the bottom of organizations are often in agreement. When you look at organizational theory, there's this weird thing. It's the middle of the organization, which often is sometimes seems out of line, but it's the part of the organization that drives the organization often, right? It's that middle part that where people are really doing the work of the organization. So that's where you really have to think about um, this, that, that ambassador model that I talked about earlier. How are you creating the right stakeholders so that they feel they have a buy-in to the messaging? And that's both a leadership strategy as well as you said sort of a bottom-up strategy. So like I said, I whether it's creating committees, um, feedback loops, all of those kinds of things, that's one way to get to that middle of the organization, but then you have to make sure you get feedback. And the other reason I said that survey that we did, that being at NYU survey, was very much about 
about that. How do you get to all parts of your organization? And then, the, and then how do you provide feedback? That being at NYU assessment, I then developed committees. Then we developed a website. I communicate on that website about what the strategic priorities are that the community identified, and then how we're following up on those strategic priorities. And I communicate that across the organization. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you once again. On behalf of the University of Toronto and the Division of Human Resources and Equity, we just want to express our appreciation with this small token. Uh, thank you so very much for nourishing us uh, with your words today. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. Thank you everyone for that insightful discussion. I would now at this time like to invite Minky Samuel, the program coordinator at the Anti-Racism and Cultural Diversity Office to close today's programming. Good afternoon to everyone present here. On behalf of the Anti-Racism and Cultural Diversity Office, we would like to begin by expressing a sincere thank you to Dr. Lisa Coleman for being present with us here today. We've learned a great deal. Um, we've learned a great deal from Dr. Coleman today. Specifically for me, my takeaway is around operationalizing EDI work within a university context, and I really would like to thank you for that. Your presentation will certainly advance the conversation on racial equity, diversity, and inclusion here at the University of Toronto. However, these events are only possible with ongoing leadership of senior administration, including President Merrick Gertlow, Vice President, Human Resources and Equity, Kelly Hannah Moffitt, Executive Director of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, Karima Hashmani, and thank you for your continued support of this work. A special thank you must be extended to everyone who participated in today's programming, including Michael White, Numan Ashraf, and of course, Saima Beg, who is our MC of today. Thank you, give her a round of applause. We would like to express our deep appreciation to the Hmong School of Global Affairs and Public Policy for allowing us to use their excellent facilities to host our first speaker series event. A heartfelt thanks to Daria and Adam for all the logistical and technical support to ensure today's proceedings ran smoothly. And special thanks to Kyle Phillips from AI Media for providing closed captioning services for those viewing this event online and on live stream. Finally, throughout the planning process, we have been fortunate enough to be assisted by a team of very motivated and dedicated colleagues from the Human Resources and Equity Communications team. A heartfelt thank you to Haley Fuller, Tom Spence, and Will Campbell for their time and dedication to ensuring this event was indeed a success. We'd like to thank all of you, of course, for attending the event, and all of us joining on live stream via the link. An evaluation survey will be sent to you shortly. We look forward to each, and each of you joining us on November 25th for our second speaker series event in collaboration with Heart House. The keynote speaker will be Dr. Shaheen Azmi from the Ontario Human Rights Commission, and the topic will focus on responding to race-based human rights complaints, understanding institutional responsibility. Thank you again, everyone, for being here. Have a great afternoon. And to those who are participating, have a great Halloween. <laughs>